Let's pray real quick. Or watch a video. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. Hold your applause until all the contestants have been announced. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm going to skip the bikini competition, if that's okay with anybody. <laughs> is it that funny? I, I guess it is. How you doing tonight? Here we have Wednesday nights here at Crossroads Community Church, the brightest uh, most uh, devout uh, people there are in the county all coming out to the county. Uh, and it's just, this is just us, right? So don't tell anybody else. Um, we're on. How you doing? Are you doing good tonight? You ready to dig into God's Word a little bit? That's what we're going to do. We're going to dig in uh, to a couple of verses in uh, Hebrews, which are... Uh, uh, whenever you ask a, a pastor or a theologian, you know, some such person uh, to, uh, you know, what are some real difficult passages to, to teach or to understand? And, and this is one of those passages that they usually put on that short list, although uh, I'll tell you right now, we're, I, I have no intention of handling any of the tricky stuff. We're going to just kind of go with the, the plain, clear stuff so you can... Uh, you know, relax and uh, open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. And uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Hey, I want to ask you, though, I think this is something that everybody's been through at, at one point or another, but how long has it been? And it doesn't matter what the context, homework, you know, family, friends, whatever, but how long has it been since somebody uh, looked at you and said, what a big baby? Has it been a while? Uh, not that long, huh? Well, um, and you know, and how did that make you feel? I remember when uh, I was in uh, uh, high school, I, I had met this uh, stunningly beautiful young woman during the summer before school started, and, and then uh, once I got to know her, it turns out she was equally as stunningly beautiful on the inside, and so you know, I was captivated, and uh, she had been, uh, she lived over in southeast Portland, and she had been walking through the, one of the, I guess they didn't call them malls back then, it was just a shopping center, and then they, I don't know, now it's a mall, um, and she was accosted, I use that word generously, accosted by a couple of young adults, you know, we were 15, 16, and uh, these older, you know, 19, 20 <laughs> grown-ups, um, accosted her with this little booklet and stuff and, you know, do you know that God has a wonderful plan for your life and all that stuff, and it made sense. And so, you know, we, she, or I wasn't with her. She kind of went with the flow of it. And then later, you know, next time we were together, she told me about it. And these uh, college age, you know, young adult age uh, folks had invited the two of us to this uh, little get-together at somebody's house. Now, my, uh, you know, operating philosophy was, if she's going, I'm going, you know, that's, that was settled it for me, and she wanted to go, so we went, and there was, a, I remember there was a guy there named Paul that I kind of, you know, related to and kind of liked him, and this really nice young gal named Ruth Ann, and I realize, you know, when you're 15 and they're 20, it's, you know, they might as well be 30, 40, 50, they're just these, you know, grown-up <laughs> adult people, and, uh, and so I was talking with this guy, Paul, and we were kind of making friends, and, and uh, he uh, introduced me to a, a friend of his, uh, one of the older, uh, you know, older, 19-year-olds, and, uh, and he said, this is Ron, he goes, this is Ron, and this is Mary, he goes, they're babies, and I went, oh, Yeah? you know, kind of a thing. It's like I was, I didn't, I was turned red. I was kind of embarrassed and a little bit ticked. And I didn't, you know, it, it didn't sit well. Well, they're just babies. 
And, I, you know, she, I must have, you know, been, uh, had the gift of discernment because he quickly uh, corrected the situation, said, oh, they're, they're babies in the Lord. They're, they're brand new to the Lord. And we were, we were so new, I don't know if I was actually had been delivered yet, you know, technically. But uh, that's how new we were. And so we were babies. And, and you know, I, I kind of got over that. We were, we were babies in the Lord spiritually. Uh, y- years later, here at Crossroads, it must have been, uh, let me think, it was about 1985. And uh, I was only seven back then. And... Uh, Okay, we're going to pray that, that cast out the demon of lying later on. Anyway, so I'm here at Crossroads, and I had, I had uh, came here right after I had sort of hit bottom. I got tired of banging into the, you know, the dead-end brick wall and said, okay, God, if you even exist, I'm going to give you a shot because I've messed this thing up pretty good, you know. Let's see if you can fix it, and of course he did. And it wasn't too long after that, a couple of weeks, I had... Uh, went through the yellow pages looking for a church to go to, and I didn't know anything about all the different denominations. Uh, the only thing I did know was that I just the idea made me uncomfortable. Why are we all, you know, divvied up into little denominations and basically, uh, you know, uh, are founded on what we disagree with everybody else about? I didn't like that idea, so I kept going. I got to the back, and I found the non-denominational churches, and the one with the biggest, you know, most attractive ad, uh, so this is way before the Internet, was Crossroads Community Church. So I uh, came out here and, and uh, you know, fell in love with the place the very the day I walked in the door. It was just like, this is home. These people, uh, they don't know me, but they love me. And after a few weeks when they did get to know me, believe it or not, they still love me. And it was just a wonderful place to be. As before this building was built, we were over in what is now the chapel. That was the, that was the whole shebang back in those days. And uh, so I just kind of plugged in, you know, I, and it was really tough. I, I got to say, I'm a lifelong musician, and I went up and volunteered to play on the worship team, whatever you need, guitar, bass, drums, I can sing, you know, whatever you need to do, I'll be glad to help out. And they, they uh, were in a big hurry to not call me, apparently. And it was months and months, and I finally kind of wrote a letter and said, hey, you know, what does a guy have to do to get involved here? I mean, I'm not looking for a big ego stroke to be up in the front, but I want to, this, this is my church now, I want to be a part of it, I want to contribute, and they, you know, they said, we need help with, and I raised my hand, and before I knew it, I was a Sunday school teacher, and, uh, and then I did that one other time, and turned out I was a janitor, and didn't know it, because I was the world's worst janitor, and that lasted about two weeks. Apparently, they found a banana peel in one of the garbage cans I was supposed to have emptied. I did empty that thing. But somebody snuck in behind me with a banana peel. So that career was over. But anyway, I just plugged in wherever. We had a choir back then. I sang on it. I hated it. I didn't like the choir. I didn't like the music. But I wanted to be here doing whatever was going on. And uh, so I just, you know, plugged in at every opportunity. Literally had to fight my way into a home group because apparently they weren't accepting any new members. <laughs> and I went, I remember thinking, oh, yeah? You know, so I just showed up one Friday, and the next thing you know, I'm in the, and now I'm in a home group, and then I'm, next thing you know, I'm leading a home group, and, all, you know, I just wanted to get plugged in. And so, I don't know, it was several months later, probably, you know, fall of that same year after I had first come in the, uh, spring, late spring, early summer. And uh, back in those days, the new believers class was a guy who it turned out was worked for the IRS, which immediately made him suspect in my book. <laughs> turns out he was a nice guy. He's no longer with us. He's with the Lord now, you know. And, uh, but, uh, and there were only two or three other people in there. And, there, and it wasn't a real, you know, organized, systematic kind of a thing, but it was after the service in the morning, you go to one of the classrooms, and there's Paul and a couple of people, and there was this one gal in the class, and I don't know, she's about my age. I, I, you know, I never did catch her name, or we didn't really get to know one another, but we were in this New Believers class every week for 
you know, five or six weeks. And so you kind of, and then, you know, get to know somebody and you see him around the church and then I go, hey, hey, how's it going? How you doing? Because I don't know her name, you know, and she doesn't know mine. Well, hi, hi, how is it? And then I remember one time I'm out in the, the lobby where that staircase is over there and uh, I was working behind the counter. I don't know what I was doing, taking sign-ups for something, just anything I could do to, to help out and be a part of what God was doing here. And I remember this gal who just maybe three, four, six months maximum had gone through the new believers thing with me. And I'm at the counter and she came up to sign up or whatever it was. And I still didn't know her name and she still didn't know mine, but we recognized each other. And she kind of said, wow, you have really, uh, you know, taken off, haven't you? And I remember thinking, well, I mean, have I? I just, I mean, I, I didn't think, I didn't feel like I'd done anything unusual or anything special. I loved the Lord and, and he loved me. That even had a bigger impact on me. And whenever they needed help, I would help. And if it was playing in the band or teaching Sunday school or taking sign-ups or mowing the lawn or, you know, not emptying the trash, whatever it was, uh, I was glad to do it and didn't really um, consider it to be any sort of special you know, uh, approach or uh, tactic towards anything. I just remember thinking, well, you know, you, she goes, you've really taken off, you know. And I remember thinking, I didn't say this, but I remember thinking, well, you haven't. You know, what, what happened? It's like, where have you been? What, what, you know, why aren't you taking sign-ups and emptying garbage cans and, and whatever, you know, opportunities there are? What I remember thinking, that's just odd that I'm just doing sort of what I consider the bare minimum, uh, you know, just simply responding to Jesus. And, and to her, that was an impressive, you know, unusual thing that just blew me away. So I, and I always think of those two times, you know, the first time the, the guy's calling me a, a baby and I was kind of offended till I understood what he meant. And then now this is years later, uh, maybe 10 or so years later, and now here's somebody telling me, boy, you're really, you know, taking off in the faith. And I'm thinking, well, no, no, now, now I really am a baby, you know, uh, kind of a thing. It was just odd. Um, you know, we all start out the same way. Uh, we all start out as babies, both physically and spiritually. That's in that business in John chapter 3 when uh, one of the uh, one of the, or the teacher, I should say, uh, from the Sanhedrin came to Jesus at night. Remember Nicodemus? I like to call him Nick at night. He snuck out at night so nobody could see him. And, you know, teacher, we know that you're a man from God because nobody could do the things you do if God weren't with him. Now, of course, that wasn't the majority opinion, but uh, uh, one of the things that Jesus told him, he said, you are the teacher of Israel. And it's interesting in the text, he doesn't say you're a teacher. You're the teacher. So apparently Nicodemus was, you know, at the, the top of the heap when it came to uh, teachers of the, of the Torah and so forth. And so you are the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things because you, you, you have to be born again. Well, that makes perfect sense, you know, because you're, you're born physically and you're a baby and you're helpless. And if it's not for mom or dad or some adult to take care of you and tend to your needs and, uh, you know, you, you may not survive, let alone be comfortable and, and happy. So, you know, yeah, you have to be born again. And spiritually, that is the case. You know, you're, you simply respond to Jesus and whether it was here and you came forward one Sunday or whether it was a long time ago, you know, in, in a galaxy far, far away or whatever. And, you know, and you responded to Jesus, but you were a newborn baby, spiritually, you know, literally wet behind the ears. I remember when, you know, my, our son was born and they, that was back in the olden days when the fathers were in the father's room. They don't do that anymore. Now everybody's in there together. But, uh, and, and they brought him to me. I remember my dad was in there with me and they brought, you know, they brought this little guy out and he's all sticky and gooey and, you know, it's like, well, I'm glad I wasn't in there. You know, it's, it's, and that's literally what we are spiritually. 
sticky and gooey and helpless, and the only thing we know how to do is cry, if there's a, whether it's a big problem or a little problem, or sometimes just for fun, you know, we make a fuss. Uh, but we're born again spiritually. And, you know, b- babies, they, they have to wear diapers, and the diapers have to be changed. And when they're hungry, you know, again, the only way they have to communicate is just to cry. And it's up to you to figure out what they need, unless, of course, you're the mom, because then you know the difference between the wet diaper cry and the I'm hungry cry, or I, it's cold and I need another blanket cry, or the, I don't like this TV show cry, and you can, you, you know, you follow up on all those things, and, and if you don't, you know, uh, the babies aren't healthy if they survive at all. And, and here's the thing, if your baby doesn't cry, and if they don't, you know, won't eat, and, and, and they, you know, they they don't seem to get hungry or have any other needs, you know there's something seriously wrong, right? There's, there's something going on there. But, you know, you don't expect babies to stay babies forever, right? They, they grow up, they learn, they, they change, they go from smiling and drooling to walking and talking and I warned my kids, you know, I said, you're going to be, come on, baby, just take that first step. You can do it. You can do it. Well, come on. Mama, daddy. And then six months later, so I wish they'd just sit down and shut up. They're driving me nuts. I can't, you know, but that's what we do. They, they, they grow up. They develop physically, emotionally, you know, intellectually. They go to preschool and kindergarten and hopefully, you know, high school and college or whatever, and, and uh, you know, and, and continue to learn and continue to grow. And the, the point is, is that whether it's through experience or training, healthy babies learn and grow until they're not babies anymore, right? Well, that's kind of the point here the writer of Hebrews makes in chapter 5, or he, he, he is making along the way. Now, if I accidentally slip up and refer to Paul as the writer, just know that that's probably true, but it, no, no, I'm kidding. Um, I think Paul may very well be the writer, but he might not be, but I have a tendency to say Paul, and then someone has to say, no, we might not be Paul. Okay, so work with me on that, if you will. These, he, these believers that he's talking to here, you know, Hebrews is a book written by a Hebrew to Hebrews. It's kind of speaking their language. There's a lot of Jewish uh, references or there's, uh, things are mentioned and talked about that the writer assumes that the readers are going to understand based on familiarity with Jewish culture. That's why the book is called Hebrews. It's to the Hebrews, and so the audience are, are, is those Jewish believers. And really, you know, I, uh, there's a one-sentence uh, Bible study, if you want to call it that, on, on the book of Hebrews. The whole book of Hebrews, the point of the whole thing is to, is to prove or to make the statement that Jesus is a better way. That's right, a better way. You know, he's better than the high priest, he's better than Moses, uh, better than any other thing than, than following the law or anything else one might do. He's, he's the, the superior way. And so that's the process that he's in here. We're roughly, you know, not maybe just right around halfway through the book uh, when we get to chapter 5. And uh, he, he says to him, look, you guys have been around long enough. You're old enough spiritually you know, from their new birth of faith in the Lord, whether they're 80 or 18 wasn't, wasn't the point. It's you guys are, have been around long enough now uh, and been through enough that you ought to have moved beyond the baby stage, right? That's what he's telling them. I don't know how long exactly it's been, but, you know, you folks who grew up in the Jewish religion and nobody has to explain the significance of the feasts and the festivals, you know, the, the way you might to a Gentile. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Oh, the Passover? Let me take three days and explain that to you. Once upon a time back in Egypt. See, they know they don't have to go through all that because these people should know. But apparently, uh, 
some of them at least, many of them, enough to deserve uh, the writer's mention here. They don't, uh, they don't get that. They haven't grown up, and, and they're still spiritual babies. Now, he begins this back in chapter 5, verse 6. He quotes from Psalm 110, verse 4, um, Hebrews 5, 6, and at the uh, and you can tell this is an Old Testament quote, uh, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, what he's doing is he's going to use this uh, just as a quick example for them. You know, he, he's saying, you people should know who Melchizedek was. You should understand the significance of that name. You know, who he was, what he was, where he was, what he was, when he was, who he was, and, and all the rest, but, but apparently they don't. Look down in verse 10, uh, again, according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say, and, and, and it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. In essence, he's saying, you know, you guys, you should be beyond this now. You shouldn't, we shouldn't have to teach you about Melchizedek. You should understand that, but apparently you've become uh, dull of hearing about that. Uh, and he's using that Melchizedek as kind of a yardstick to measure their maturity level. You know, if you don't know much about him, then how much do you really know? I guess you could kind of use that today. I don't know if it would be fair, but, you know, someone who knew some stuff about Melchizedek versus someone who really doesn't? Is it Mel Melchizedek? How do you say that? You know, Mephibosheth? What's, who, what's that? Is that somebody's horse's name? You know, there, I guess you could do that, kind of play the drop the name game and, 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 and see if someone is knowledgeable about those things and determine whether or not they're spiritual, spiritual babies or not. Uh, I don't know if we want to do that, but that's kind of what he's hinting at here. He, he says, I have a lot to say about this guy, Melchizedek, uh, much about him that would lead to a deeper understanding and experience of Jesus. Uh, but it's hard to explain, you know, based on their immaturity, their failure to thrive, their failure to, to grow uh, after the new birth. That hard to explain is an interesting phrase. It's not really difficult. The New Living Translation says it's, it's hard to make you understand. In other words, it's not the information that's difficult. It's hard to make you, to get you to understand. Or, you know, it's funny, Pastor Daniel is hanging out with Eugene Peterson who, who translated the Message Bible and, and uh, the, the Message has this verse. It's just hard to get it across, you know? I, I can't seem to get it across to you folks. You're, you're, you're still babies and, and you should be beyond this, this by now. And, and now why? Why was it hard to get across? Look what he says. Uh, you've become dull of hearing. Or again, the new living. You don't seem to listen. You should know about this by now, but when, when it comes up, you don't seem to listen. Or, or uh, again, Eugene Peterson translates it. You've picked up this bad habit of not listening. Sounds like a teenager. <laughs> doesn't it? You know, you've picked up this really bad habit of not listening to, to what, what I tell you, what people tell you. So he's going to go on to explain a lot about this Melchizedek after this passage, but for now, here's kind of the primary principle I, I want you to get and that we're going to kind of dig into and, and take apart here for the rest of our time together. Um, there are powerful, life-changing truths tucked away in God's Word, things that you ought to know. More than that, things that you want to know, things that you want to be in on and know about, but before they can become a reality in your life, you've got to go beyond the basics of the faith and move toward maturity. You've got to make intentional uh, steps to move from that newborn baby stage, you know, on through 
uh, you know, a toddler and, and on up, and then there's the teenager stage, and finally the adult stage, and then beyond that, hopefully, is what some people call the sage stage, you know, where you've made all the mistakes there are to make, and now finally you know better. And now you're just wishing there was somebody to listen to you who would heed the warning. So that's the principle. There are life-changing truths in the Word that you want to know, not somebody telling you you need to, you better. You know, it's just, no, no, I, you want to know these things, but, bef uh, but they, won't, they can't become reality in your life unless you get beyond the basics and move toward maturity. Now notice, let me see, pick it up here in verse 11 again, uh, of whom we have much to say uh, and hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. In verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you've come to need milk, not solid food. You know, you should be teaching by now. Uh, you know, uh, you, should be, uh, you should be able to share with others. He's not talking about the calling of a teacher. He's just talking about regular folks, talking to other regular folks. He says, by this point, you ought to be able to just explain, you know, stuff to people about your faith. Who's Jesus? What did he do? What difference does it make? He died for your sin. Great. What, you know, what's that about? I, I still will, you know, never uh, live down uh, that moment. I was in, uh, what, it was like 16 or something, and I'd hitchhiked to uh, Los Angeles to become rich and famous. That worked out pretty good for me. Um, and I'm standing on the corner. You ever, it's hard to walk around with a steel guitar in the case because they weigh about 60 pounds. So, you know, after a couple of blocks, it's more like this. And, and I'm standing on a corner, I was hoping to catch a bus, and I saw these two guys coming like a, from a, a, the other block up the other, at the other corner, and they were kind of walking, you know, they were just happy to be alive. And they got close to me and they said, hey brother, have you heard about Jesus? And I said, yeah, 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 I, you know, I, I have, and, and I don't want to hear about it. And, and they went, well, you know, he died for your sin. <laughs> I remember Mr. Smarty Pants here says, well, he should have checked with me first. Because I didn't get it. I mean, I didn't know. Jesus died for my sin, why? I, I just didn't, you know, I, I, the whole, the thing, the gospel, the truth had not come together in my little, you know, uh, puny, 16-year-old, you know, still got a long ways to go to be fully grown brain. <laughs> so, you know, he said, I didn't know. And then Paul saying to these guys, I did it, there I did it, Paul. The writer said to these guys, uh, you know, this, by this time you ought to be able to explain things to others, but instead you need someone to explain them to you. And we're talking about the first principles of the oracles of God. Interesting little word there, that first principles. Literally, it, it means the ABCs, you know, the one, two, threes, uh, the kindergarten stuff where you get the little blocks and you stack them up, A, and then after A comes B. Oh, really good, Johnny. What comes after B? C, oh, we're on a roll, you know, and you can count to 10, you know, or write it or at least read it. V just the ABCs, the very basic stuff. He goes, you guys still need that. You need milk, not solid food. There's a reference to that baby imagery. You guys ought to be chewing on double-doubles, you know, if you're from Southern California. Uh, in and out burgers. You guys ought to be chowing down, but you still need to nurse. You still need a baby bottle. You know, that's, that's, that's not right. You've been in this long enough. I mean, look around a little bit, and I'm looking and I'm seeing, you know, the average age here, I'm just going to guess real quick, uh, if you include me. Well, let's just take a wild guess and say the average age is 40, Okay. What do you do if you see a 40-year-old, you know, with a, in a diaper, in a pacifier? It's 40 years old. 
You should, be, you should know how to put on your own shoes and socks by now. You should be able to get dressed. You should be able to function, you know, have a life, drive a car, take care of yourself. But no, you're 40, but you're still living like a baby. And that's kind of the thing here. You guys have been in this long enough where you should be teaching others, but you're still on the bottle. You know, and, and, it, and uh, uh, anyway, that's, he's getting towards his point that that's not how it should be. Verse 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk, you know, babies, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. And by word of righteousness, he simply means the scriptures. For he is a babe. Unskilled can also be translated inexperienced. You you just haven't put in the time. You're inexperienced in the word of righteousness. And of course, the oracles of God, like I said, just simply refers to the scriptures. Now, let's jump down to chapter 6 here and keep this going. Therefore, because of all that, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, right, the ABCs, the one, two, threes uh, of Christ, leaving behind those things, let's go on to perfection. A better word is completion. A lot of times, especially in this New King James, you see the word perfection, and he's not talking about flawless perfection. He's talking about finished. It's like a a painter or like a songwriter. You know, I've written lots of songs that are finished, but they're not perfect. But they're finished. They're complete. Or a painter can stand back and go, okay, that last little stroke of the green, there it is. Ta-da, it's done. And then it might be a week or six months later, oh, you know, I should have put a little darker, I should have put some shading up in this part and this, but, but it was finished. So that's what he means when he says uh, complete. He doesn't mean literally perfect, flawless, but just, you know, it should be complete by now. Um, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. There's, there's quite a list here of these uh, what he considers ABCs, foundational, fundamental uh, concepts or, or doctrines that, uh, you know, anyone who's moved beyond the baby stage ought to have enough of a handle on. He's not saying we all need to be PhD theologians, but we should. You know, he, he expects us to have a, a good enough handle on them to tell someone else about it. I mean, why did Jesus die for your sin? Why should he have checked with me first? You know, what's, what's that really about? Well, it's not just all the dumb things I've done, but it's the thing inside of me that sort of pulls at me or compels me to do those dumb things that, 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 that is sin in me. And I can't stop it. I can resist. I can fight it. I can pretend I'm better than I really am, uh, but the honest, you know, truth is that that nature is in me, and the only way to to reestablish a connection with God is to have that problem fixed for me, which is exactly why Jesus came, and why He was born, lived, died on the cross, resurrected, and ascended to solve the, he, did Jesus died for your sins? My answer should have been, oh man, Whew. good thing, because I didn't, because I was hopeless, but I didn't get it. I didn't understand that part of it, and so that's kind of the people he's talking about here. Listen, look in, listen to these, looking, is that a word? Looking to these, <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, repentance from dead works, well, remember, he's talking to Hebrews here, right? And so the whole entire Jewish religion was about works, sacrifices offered, uh, you know, prayers, uh, rules followed, laws obeyed, toe the line, and if you do it perfect, you know, then you've got kind of an in with God. He'll be happy and smile on you. But, of course, we know that no one was ever able to actually do that, but that was the thinking he goes, you guys need to get beyond that. The, the, the foundation, you know, of dead works. Repentance from dead works. Man, I had a discussion with a guy today about repentance. And uh, 
uh, you know, if you're new to the faith, uh, let me just give you kind of a little preview of where you're headed. Because if this year, if in 2015 there were three things that came to mind that you needed to change your thinking about, that's what repentance is. I used to think this was cool. Now I realize it's not cool. It's, so, it's not only is it not cool, it's harmful. Okay, so the three of those things came to mind this year and you re- changed your thinking and repented. Then the next year, it's going to be six or eight. See, and you might think, well, the longer I walk with the Lord, the less sin I'll have to confess. No, that's not the way it works. Because the longer you walk with the Lord, the more mature you get, the more things about your, just your attitude towards life and the, your oh, what's the fancy word, your worldview, you know, your paradigm, the lens through which you see all of life is distorted and skewed. And as you come more in line with God's reality, you realize that there's all this stuff I need to change my thinking about. Man, I used to think this was okay, but now, you know, I I realize it. What What a jerk. I'll tell you a true story. This is a quick one. If, if my son is in here, that would be a good time to leave. Not that it's going to embarrass him. It's going to embarrass me. Now, this is one of the, truly, this is something that I am just ashamed of. Just there's no other way to say it. But I did it. And at the time, I was kind of sorry, but I didn't realize the impact of it. Uh, we lived not too far from the school the kids went to in grade school. And... Uh, and so I'm home, I, was, I worked at night, and I'm home in the daytime, and I get the call from Lincoln School, hey, can you come pick up Corby? And so, sure, I'll be right up. Well, as soon as I hung up the phone, I think I went back to something else, and I'll be right up, turned into about a half an hour. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh! <gasps> oh, man, I'm supposed to go get Corb. And so I I get in the car and I drive up and I get about a half a block from the house and I see here he is, he's walking home. But that's not the bad part. The bad part was when he left the school, he really had to go to the bathroom. Number, which number would it be? I forgot how to count those, but it's, you know... uh, And so I picked him up, and he, you know, he was unable to hold his water, so to speak, not because of some weird, you know, he's a freak or anything, but he's like 11 years old, and dad let him down, and he's in the middle of, you know, walking home, and there's no place to go, and you can't go knock on a stranger's door and say, can I use your restroom, please? And so I pick him up. Oh, I felt awful. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I can't believe I did this. You know, I can't believe I'm such a flaky dad. I'm no good. And he was very cool about it. Oh, it's okay. You know, I'll change my clothes. And he wasn't crying and throwing a fit or, you know. But, but I mean, it had to hurt to just feel forgotten about and, and you know, abandoned or left, you know. Uh, and, and uh, man, I, I just felt awful about that. But it wasn't until years later that, the, the reality of my failure in that really hit me. What? You're, you're, a, you're his father. You're supposed to be responsible for him and responsible to him. And when he called, you said you'd be right there. And honestly, you had no intention of dropping everything and going right up there to pick that little guy up. You went back to whatever you were doing, probably something with, you know, music-related thing. And, and man, you know, finally, years later, it came to point where I, I got to repent of that. I, you know, I mean, I, that's, uh, I wasn't too happy about it then, but it was more like, gee, I hope he's not mad at me. You know, that was my apology. I'm sorry that, you know, for all you went through, but then the repentance part was when I was sorry for my side of it, for just being a lousy father. I suppose equal time rule applies here. When our daughter was little, she went to a preschool, and it was my job to go pick her up every day, and it was Christmas time. And so, you know, the the teachers, it wasn't a big show or a pageant, but the kids, you know, the three or four-year-olds, whatever they were, were going to sing Jingle Bells and show us the, you know, is that a reindeer or is that, is that, what is that? 
you know? <laughs> and so I'm supposed to go to the, I'm pick her up, you know, normal time and see the song. And again, I'm dinking around at home, probably down in my little music studio. And all of a sudden, oh, I got to go, I got to go again. I got to pick Rachel up. And I get in the car and I race out there and I come into the front room and, and just as they're singing the last song, and all the little, you know, the little kids are down there and they're just, you know, cute as cute could be. And there's my little sweetheart, daddy's little angel. And she looks around and she's been looking around now for probably 20 minutes, right? Because I wasn't there. And then finally she looks and she sees me and her face lights up. And I could tell she was thinking, oh, there you are. As if I was there the whole time and she couldn't find me. And of course I knew that I had just kind of sleezed in at the last minute like a loser. And, uh, you know, and again, it was, uh, I wasn't going to let her know what a, you know, what a jerk of a father I was. But years later, you know, the Lord really convicted me. It's like, what were you thinking? Uh, are those kids not the most important thing in the world to you? Yeah, yeah, they, they are. They really are. Well, then what was so important that you couldn't be there when you were supposed to be there? You know, there was gas in the car. You didn't have a flat tire. There wasn't a wreck on the freeway. There was no legitimate excuse other than that you're just an idiot. You're just a loser when it comes to that thing. And I had to go, yeah, boy, wasn't I. I really was. That's what repentance is. He says we need to get beyond that as, I don't know what's the word, as advanced as that may seem. We need to get beyond you know, the repentance stage, uh, and, we, and, he, and faith toward God. He goes, by now you shouldn't have to teach you about faith. I mean, for goodness sake, you're saved by grace through faith, and you're expecting to spend eternity with God uh, because, of what, because of your faith in the, the deliverance he's provided, and we shouldn't have to now teach you, you know, when you're in the sixth grade, we shouldn't have to teach you the kindergarten level stuff. Or of the doctrine of baptisms. Uh, and notice the plural. I think he has in mind both water and spirit baptisms, uh, as, as well as the baptisms associated the mikvah of, of the Jewish religion, mikvahs, baths, or, or the laying on of hands, or the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. He goes, and this will do if God permits. You know, we'll go over it again for you. You know, I had to take a remedial math class in high school, not because I was, you know, uh, un unable to learn math, but I was just too busy being cool to pay attention in the 6th and 7th and 8th grade. So by the 10th grade, I had to take a class in how to balance your checkbook, you know? Uh, and that's kind of the thing here. We'll, we'll go over this stuff for you again if we have to, but really, you're 40 years old. You shouldn't be wearing a diaper sucking on a pacifier. You should be grown up. You should be moving towards maturity by now. The laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, the eternal judgment, talking about the end times. Now, notice here how he describes uh, the spiritually mature. Well, he, he already started that in verse 12. You should be teachers by now. Again, not those who are called and called to teach with the gift of teaching, but just you should be able to tell others about, you know, what you know because you should know. You know, you, you, you ought to know by now. Uh, and verse, uh, where are we at? Um, 14, I'm back in chapter 5 again, but solid food, you know, we talked about you're, you're still drinking milk. Solid food belongs to those who are of full age, those that are grown up, those who by reason of use, now this is a great verse, by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Let me pick that part, uh, that verse apart for you a little bit. Full age, he's just talking about maturity. He's making the contrast or uh, we should be aware of the contrast between age and maturity, right? You can be uh, I mean, they aren't the same thing. Just because you've been a Christian for 10 years and you can look back and say, I'm 10 years old in the Lord, you still may only have the maturity of someone who got saved last Sunday because you haven't moved toward 
maturity. You, you know, that's, uh, that's the problem. This full age, it's not based on time. Your senses, he's talking about the faculties of perception and understanding, not to be confused with the phys five physical senses. But you should have your, uh, oh, where am I at here? Have senses exercised. Now, here's a real gem for you Bible students. The word exercised here is, is in Greek, is the root word from which we get our English word gymnasium. He said, man, you should be working out. You know, your uh, ability to perceive spiritual truth, you, you should be working that out like, like at a gym. You should be getting stronger and better at it. And at the end of the verse, he mentions to discern both good and evil, discernment, to be able to tell the difference between good and evil. You know, truth and lies and right and wrong and God's spirit and whatever, uh, whatever other spirit there may be. I, I fielded a phone call this morning from a, here at the church from a gal who I, I don't think I've ever met. I don't remember her name and I didn't recognize it then. But she had a question about, uh, she had come into contact with someone who was uh, trying to, who was very mm, adamantly, you know, persistently, uh, working to persuade her that in order to really be saved and, and really look forward to eternity in the presence of the Lord, uh, you know, after this temporary life is over, you have to not only believe in Jesus, but you have to follow all the Jewish laws. You know, do the, the, observe the Sabbath, observe the feasts, follow all the dietary rules, the hand washing. You can't, you know, pull your donkey out of a ditch after sundown Friday and, and all that stuff. And, and, and uh, fortunately, you know, she kind of knew that that was not, she, well, I mean, that's kind of the point. She knew that wasn't true. She had invested enough to grow toward maturity enough to, to discern, you know, she went to the spiritual gym and had her intellectual capacity exercised enough to know the difference between uh, truth and a falsehood. Not a malicious falsehood, at least not intentionally. This, this person apparently was really convinced that that was the case, that you had to live a, 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 according to the Torah and, and believe in Jesus to be a Christian. And this person thought they were being helpful you know, providing some, some uh, you know, essential information. You got it wrong all this time. Here's what you need to do. But her senses were exercised enough where she immediately recognized, that, that's not right, is it? And so she called, you know, she actually called to talk to Pastor Daniel and he wasn't here, I got the call. But she was gonna call, you know, someone who's supposed to know to, is, is this is what they said, is that really true? And I said, no, it's not. You know, and it was impressive because she didn't know the theological terminology or any of that sort of, you know, highfalutin, uh, you know, language and stuff. She just knew that, that she was saved by grace through faith. And when someone challenged that, she knew it wasn't right, and, and she was just kind of double-checking to make sure. So, you know, I, I haven't been keeping track. We've been here like a couple hours already. I haven't been keeping track of time. To, when it's time to stop, just start to boo me, and I'll know that I should shut up. Are we okay? Nobody wants to? Well, so a few people have left. See, there goes one right now. <laughs> oh, don't look. Don't look. I didn't want to embarrass anybody. That wasn't my intention. That was just perfect timing. Um, okay, I, I'll wrap it up here pretty quick because we're going to get to the end of the passage. Anyway, verse 1 in chapter 6 tells us, starts to tell us how to move toward maturity when it says leaving the discussion. That's an active verb. I mean, it's leave behind, leave it behind, get out of there, move on, press on, be carried along by the truth to, and again, it's the, the word here is uh, perfection, but to completion, to maturity, you know? I guess you're old enough to decide if you're going to go to school or not, and, but if you don't go, you know, you're, you, you won't learn much. And, and so make that quality decision to go. Press on to maturity. Now think about your life. 
What would happen? What would life be like if you got beyond the basics of the Christian faith and moved toward maturity? You know, just think, if you had a handle on all those things that he described here as elementary and, and foundational principles, and you were well on your way to understanding those, you know, life-changing truths that are tucked away in the Word. What, what would that be like? Well, first and foremost, you'd be safe. Uh, you'd, you'd be safe from the lure of the world or, or the flesh uh, to pull you away from God. Why? Because you'd know better. You'd recognize the enemy's attack. You know, I, I've been married, you know, for for uh, whatever. Well, for me, it's coming up on 44 years. I've been married for 44 years, and everything has just been, you know, I mean, we've had our ups and downs, but here we are 44 years later. It's still, still, you know, living happily ever after. And then I'm on vacation in Hawaii. I get in the elevator, and right behind me before the door closes comes this really cute young girl, and she kind of winks at me and says, hey, you looking for a little company tonight? Hmm, let me think. <laughs> you know, no, no, I'm not. I'm not looking for your company. <laughs> Have you heard about Jesus? He died for your sins. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but we're, we're safe because we're in the word. We're, you know, uh, stress and anxiety take a back seat doesn't mean everything's ever always going to go right and never go wrong, but, you know, disasters aren't nearly as disastrous when you trust the one that's always in control of the outcome, even if you can't see it. I remember when I was in, uh, what was I, like 10 years old or something, my, my dad was a musician, and that's how he kind of got me in, into that, and we had played a gig up in the Dalles, Oregon on a Friday night. And so it was, after, it was like a 9 o'clock to 1 o'clock thing at the Eagles Lodge or the American Legion or something. And so after we played, and I was, thir I was 10, and I, I, little Ronnie got up and played his little Ronnie guitar. And, uh, and we're driving home, and now it's like 2, 2.30 as we get closer to home, and, th and there's a flat tire, a blowout. <laughs> And, you know, and the dad pulls the car over, and, and, and I, I'm asleep in the back seat. I got everybody's coat on me and one for a pillow, you know, and I'm just going to sleep all the way home. And I hear the tire blow, and I kind of, you know, wake up a little bit to see what's going on. But then my dad got out of the car, you know, and I hear the back open up, and he's going to get the jack and the spare tire. What did I do? Oh, what are we going to do? It's so cold out here. We're never going to get home. No, I rolled over and went back to sleep. I knew dad had it covered. Right? Now, if Dad hadn't been there, if it had just been me, first of all, what am I doing driving at 2.30 in the morning at 10 years old? But, you know, it, we, we have that kind of security. We, we find calm even in the middle of a crisis. We know how to act and react when life hits the fan because it's going to hit the fan. I mean, that's just the world we live in. But to be able to keep your calm and, and that sense of peace that the Lord gives us, how to know how to act and react. Be ready, willing, and able to help family, friends, neighbors, whatever, when the tough times come. You know, life wouldn't, isn't going to be perfect, but you'd be ready, right? Your, your heart would be ready, your soul, your mind, your, your, your lifestyle, your, your approach to life would be ready with the wisdom and the power of God to handle whatever it is that comes your way. And let me invite the, the uh, worship team out here. And it's, this is kind of cool. They're back there working on their record. They're, well, they don't call them records anymore. Um, CDs on their, you know, electronic music media project. And uh, now they're going to turn the mic off and come out here. And there they are. See? It's like clockwork. Pretty cool. So, that's what it looks like to be a baby, and then that's what it looks like to move on to maturity. So the last question is this, how do we get there? How do I get from point A to point B? Maybe you're not as persistent as me, where you're 
well, not literally, but virtually you're going to pound down the door of the church until they let you in and so you can get involved, you know, uh, whether they want you or not. Because <laughs> that's just what you got to do. H how do we move forward like that? Well, here's a start, okay? Number one, remind yourself every day. You know, it's amazing how much of this Christian life is based on remembering Remembering reality, remembering what's true, instead of getting sucked back into this false reality and, and false truth. Just remind yourself every day that God treasures you. You, with all your warts and scars and dirt under the fingernails and the, and, and the shady past or, you know, the shady present or just whatever, God treasures you. And I like to say this to the brand new believers that come back to our prayer room every week. He can't love you more and he won't love you less. Now here's why that's important. See, that takes, that kind of takes the ammo out of the enemy's gun. He can point it at you all day long and he can even be a pretty good aim. But when you know he's really got nothing in there to shoot, then you get to be fearless. You don't have to be bulletproof because he's bulletless. Because you know that no matter what you do, no matter what happens, whatever comes your way, God's going to love you. That's not going to change. It's not, he loves you. Uh, let me rephrase that. He doesn't love you because of anything about you. I know that's a disappointment to some. He doesn't love you because he loves you in spite of everything about you. And there's nothing you can do to mess it up. There's another short, uh, abbreviated gospel, gospel statement. God loves you so much, he's rescued you in such a way that you can't mess it up. Remember that. Have open ears, sharp ears, practice the good habit of listening to God. Become experienced in the word of righteousness, what this passage calls the oracles of God. Now, if you have a headache, and a lot of us do. You don't, you don't go into you know, the medicine cabinet and pull down that aspirin bottle and, and get an aspirin out and just kind of kind of nibble on it. I got about six grains of aspirin. Oh, that'll, that'll be good. You don't do that. You take the whole aspirin. If it really hurts, you take two. If it, take, if it really hurts, you take more than that. Careful, don't take too many. But you don't just take a little nibble, right? That's how God's Word is. You, know, you can't just take a little nibble. This movement toward maturity requires some kind of investment, and you'd be amazed. Really, I started this page, started to say surprised, but I think amazed is more accurate. If, if you start your time in the Bible with God, just show me one thing about you. Just show me one thing. Don't wait until you have a crisis. Now, where's the answer to that problem? I know it's here. What do you say to the boy who says he'll call but never does? You know, what do you say to the neighbor who revs their car up at midnight while you're trying to sleep? Where's part, that's, that's not in there. But there's a lot of stuff in there that'll prevent those situations from either happening or from affecting you so negatively in the first place if you just dig into them. See, when, when you do... If you're going to get beyond the basics and move toward maturity, you got to take in the whole word. That's just a place to start. But when you do, you'll be amazed at the power to fix and change and heal your life that's tucked away in here in every detail. Okay, one last little story. See, I thought you would take you guys longer to get out here. But you're cool. You're cool. I'll, I'll try to make this quick, but I think, I know this is for somebody because the Lord just laid it on me to share this. I haven't shared it for a long time. I don't know if this is a true story or not, but the principle's true. No, no question about that. Years ago, in the days of, like, the days of the Titanic, the, the steamship days, there was a fella in England, and he wanted to go to America. And he was a young guy, you know, single guy, and he worked hard, and he saved up, and he's going to get this ticket to go to America. It's his dream. He doesn't even know what he's going to do when he gets there, but he's going to go. And he works, and he saves, and he gets the ticket, and he's got that ticket. I'm going to get on that ship, and however many X days later, I'm going to get off the boat, and I'm going to be in America. 
And so he packs for the trip and he packs enough clothes and he packs the things that he thinks he'll need when he gets there. And he packs a, a big, one of those big blocks, we used to call it welfare cheese. I don't think that's what he called it, but big giant block of cheese and some soda crackers in there because for a snack, you know, in case he gets hungry on the trip because it takes a couple of weeks. So he gets on the ship and he's just, I can't believe it. They show him to his room. It's like, you know, down 13 decks, you know, below next to the propeller and it's never quiet and it's really hot and uncomfortable and the bed's about that big. But he's, man, he could not be happier. He's got his ticket. He's on the ship. He's going to America. And so he gets, you know, every day he gets up and he kind of walks around the ship and he goes up to the deck and all the rich people are up there and he sees all the fabulous dining rooms and, and buffets and, and just all this, you know, incredible stuff that he's never seen before. And then he goes back down, you know, to his little room and gets out his cheese and crackers and has a little snack. And then he, you know, and he, and he then for the whole time he gets up and he walks around all this marvelous, extravagant, you know, rich, lux luxurious surroundings. And, and, and he's just blown away by it. And then he goes back to his room and he has the, the cheese and crackers. And then they come, they finally, they pull into the, the harbor at New York and it's time to get off the boat. And he comes up, you know, coming up all the stairs with his suitcases and stuff. And the steward, he says, hey, you know, I, I've just got to ask you. He says, I've noticed you know, that almost every day you get up and you go up to the decks and you walk around and, but you, you know, you, you never go into the dining room or you never go into the ballroom or any of those things. And, and, and the guy says, oh, well, I, you know, I, I could just barely af afford the, the ticket and, and I can't really afford to go in there and I can't, buy, you know, to buy a steak or a fancy meal or something. I, but I'm okay because down in my room, I've got these cheese and crackers and they've been keeping me you know, sustaining me, and I, I'm fine with that, and that's cool. And the steward just goes, oh, man, didn't you know? All that stuff is free. It, it's included in your ticket. You could, you could have gone to the dining room and had lobster and steak and, and glasses of milk, and, and, you know, you could have been eating all day, every day, going through the buffet line and French toast and bacon and... and, and didn't you know? And I think that's how too many of us, of us are in the sense of maturity. We settle for being cheese and crackers Christians. You know, we get a little fire insurance and we're pretty sure that when we die, something's going to happen to us. We're not sure what or where, but it's, it's probably a good thing as opposed to this other thing that we don't know or understand either, but it's probably a bad thing. And as long as I go to church, oh, every couple of weeks and, you know, stand up when they say stand up and sit down when they say sit down and, you know, then, uh, you know, then I'm okay with that. And that's, the, and, and I just want to say, don't you know that the riches of Christ, the fullness of the life he, he offers, the fullness of the life he sacrificed himself to make available for the taking means that you don't have to live like a cheese and crackers Christian. You can move on towards maturity and enjoy the fullness, the richness of, you know, the joys of knowing the Lord in good times and bad. And I just wonder how many of us were going to stand before the Lord someday and we're going to say, well, gee, we just, you know, cheese and crackers were all we really needed. And he's going to go, didn't you realize? You know, how, how did you not know? How did you, you, you could have just come in boldly to the throne of grace. You could have climbed up on your heavenly father's lap and you could have laughed with him or, or cried on his shoulder and he would have loved you and comforted you and give you wisdom and guidance and every other good thing beyond what you can ever imagine this side of eternity. There are many opportunities here at Crossroads to grow into Christian maturity. Uh, I just went to a training last night of, the, of a new uh, aspect of the home group, uh, community group program. Oh, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be fun. I can't imagine anybody not wanting to be a part of that. I just can't. 
I can't imagine it. We have our huddle every week where we introduce the foundational doctrines of what it means to simply respond to Jesus. And, you know, hardly anybody goes. I don't know why. I can't, I can't believe that nobody, that you don't want to go, that you're not counting the days until we get to go into the dining room and stop living on cheese and crackers. And there's all those opportunities here. I, I better stop now. Um, we are going to enter into a time of communion, which is just a wonderful thing. It's uh, not a mere ritual. And we want to invite, I want to invite everyone who has a living and active relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ is, is welcome to come forward for communion. It's, and, and here's the reason that it's not for people who don't. It's not because we don't love you or anything. But communion, the, the, the well, the grape juice represents wine, and the wine represents <laughs> a couple of phases removed. What it is is we're acknowledging our, not just our need, but our, the absolute necessity for spiritual nourishment from the Lord. We want to get beyond the milk, and we want to, want to move into the meat. And communion is, is a, it represents that, and it has kind of a, a really a tangible effect, a lot like water baptism does, where we, we enter in. So we want to invite everyone with a relationship with the Lord to come forward. I, I have received no special instructions, so uh, does that mean it's my choice? Uh, how we do this. I think the idea is the worship team is going to play some some uh, worship music, and when you feel ready, you can come up and receive the 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 cracker and the cup. And if you want to go back to your seat and and partake, you can. If you want to kneel at the altar, if you want to sit in the front row, if you want to go up somewhere where it's dark and quiet and contemplate for a minute before, it's entirely up to you how you celebrate this. It's a very private, very personal thing, and uh, it's just a, it's another one of those incredible uh, blessings that are ours when we get beyond the cheese and crackers, uh, milk stage in, into the meat and really understand the Lord. And last thing, before we, I'm going to invite our prayer team to come on down. Yep. Are you not the prayer team? I can't see you over there. Come on down. If you're out there, come down. And uh, I want to invite anyone that has anything at all. You know, Pastor Bill said it well. It's just dumb to leave here with a problem. It is. It's like going to the doctor and not telling him what hurts, you know? So, so come on down and pray with some folks. I think there won't be too much of a traffic jam between...